what do you believe about the law of attraction? Like if you're feeling crappy about yourself, does that mean that your life is going to be crappy because of, of that? And then does the opposite also apply? Yeah. So, I mean, there are lots of definitions of the law of attraction, but if we just keep it super simple, then it's basically bringing into your life the things that you want. And therefore, if you consistently think that you're not worthy and good things don't happen to you and that the future that you desire is unlikely, then, you know, I, I mean, I, I love that Henry Ford quote, which is, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're probably right. Um, because our whole view of the world comes from our internal narrative. So if we really believe that we don't deserve those things, or if we consistently tell ourselves that we're not going to get those things, that's statistically more likely to come true. If we learn to essentially change our mind, you know, learn to think differently, then we will act differently in the world and, and take those risks that we might not have if we you know, weren't in that better mindset. So it really always comes down to, if you want things to change in the world around you, then you need to start by changing what's going on in, in, in your brain. And so what you're saying is that it's not necessarily because your brain is just thinking a thought and all of a sudden, like there's somebody that's listening to that and they're like, all right, you're thinking this thought, I'm not going to give you anything in life. You're not going to succeed. It's more or less, um, that you're thinking that thought. And then if it's a negative thought, it's preventing you from taking the actions that you know, you need to take in order to better yourself. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, absolutely. You've understood that correctly. But if you also think about the way that we communicate with each other, because most of these goals are going to depend on interactions with other people or, you know, things that are going on in life. We communicate with each other through articulated speech. And that's the main thing that we notice, although we would notice things like body language and facial expression. But we also communicate with each other through some of the, some of the hormones in our bodies actually leak out of our, our skin through our sweat. And if you are physically close enough to someone or in contact with someone, then there's an interaction between the two people based on that. So for example, women who live together or work closely together tend to synchronize their menstrual cycles because of um, affecting each other's estrogen levels. And it works in a similar way with cortisol, the stress hormone. It doesn't matter if you're male or female, but you know, if, I'm, if I'm super stressed, then likely my you know, posture's not gonna be as good. I won't be smiling. I wouldn't be making as much eye contact. And if we were in physically, physical proximity with each other, you would actually feel stressed because I've got high levels of cortisol you know, circulating in my body. So then you know, let, let's say if we were on a date or in a job interview, some of it's conscious, but also subconsciously, you'll just feel like that person isn't right for you. So it's kind of like a you know, self-fulfilling prophecy. If you think that you're not going to meet a really nice guy on a date, then there's so many complex things about you that will make that outcome more likely to become true. And there's another thing I'd like to add, which is we've talked about abundance and manifestation and patience. But another one of the factors that I um, write about is what I call magnetic desire. And that is that you truly, deep down in your emotions, in your gut, in your mind, you know, aligned, want the things that you have put onto your action board. If it's coming from a place of, well, that's what my friends are doing, so I should do it too, or this is what society tells us will make us happy, then because that's not strongly aligned in your your beliefs your thoughts your actions um you're more likely to either give up or not really make the necessary effort for that you know to come true so it has to be a really strong true desire um because that feeds the whole process of being able to change your pathways and um taking risks to make those things come true you, t you talked about um, like rewiring our thoughts in order to like attract what we want and become a more magnetic person and be able to communicate better in relationship so that things can start to really happen and progress in our lives. Um, what else can people do 
if they're looking to become a more magnetic person, if they're looking to become a per more of a person that people want to be around, what are some other things they can do besides working on their thoughts? Let's start with the basics just so that I, I have covered that. You know, if, if you're sleeping for eight hours every night, if you're eating nutritious food, you're keeping yourself hydrated, you know, hydration is essential to the communication between neurons. Um, you know, you're like not sedentary, you're doing some deep breathing, you're oxygenating your brain and body, um, and you're doing things to make sure that your stress levels are kept under control. So mindfulness type activities or self-care activities. So start with those, because if your body isn't in an optimal state, then it's much harder for your brain to do that extra work that it needs to, to, you know, um, to be um, abundant and magnetic. And then there's the, the action board. What, what tends to happen with that sometimes is that people either hide it somewhere or what I've heard a few times with people is they, they find the images, but they don't actually stick them to the board. And that very often, so the not sticking it to the board comes down to not really fully believing that you deserve those things. And the, you know, hiding it and not talking about it may also be because, you know, you feel like you're asking for too much. You're embarrassed for other people to know, you know, what are the things that you really want? So again, you know, there would be like psychological work to do to find out why that's the case. But if you're comfortable to, then, you know, having the board on display or telling people what you're actually looking for, because then people could potentially help you. Um, and yeah, again, everything that we've said about changing your mindset, being grateful, being abundant, showing people that, you know, demonstrating that in your real life, like, you know, saying thank you to people, offering to help people, um, coming up with ideas for other people as well. So, you know, I guess that's another form of the law of attraction, which is that if you're out there making people feel good, helping them, giving them ideas, then it's obviously much more likely that people will do the same for you. I'm curious, given your background in, in science as a neuroscientist working at MIT, what led you to begin exploring and, and talking about um, things like spirituality? Yeah, somebody did actually say to me when my book came out in 2019, like, wasn't it a risk for you to write that book, considering that you're, you know, faculty at MIT? Um, and as with many things in life, I always believe that the biggest risk would have been not doing it because, um, because I felt like it, you know, doesn't fit with the, the persona of, of a scientist or an MIT professor. Um, so it goes quite way back. I mean, I was brought up in a an Indian Hindu household. So I've always had um, elements of spirituality in my life. I did think of them as very separate to the science and the medicine until I had my first major crisis in my life, which was um, when I got divorced in my mid thirties. And at that time I naturally turned to both Jungian psychology, but also um, Buddhist kind of, you know, beliefs and philosophies. And a short time after that is when I first read the book, The Master Key System, which was very inspiring to me. I'd actually read it before, but my life was fine. So I didn't do any of the exercises, but then I came back to it and I spent six months going through each chapter and doing all the exercises till I got to the end. And it's essentially about manifestation, but through gaining greater clarity and control of your thought processes. And then I started doing, so then I also changed career at the same time. And that was my main reason for starting to do these vision boards. And the first one that I did, did have a sum of money on it that I wanted to earn because I just started up a business. I no longer had my, you know, medical salary. And a friend encouraged me to make that number higher than I wanted to. I, I had a number that was, this is how much I need to earn to just live my life. And she said, well, you know, you should double it. And I didn't think I could make double, but I sort of thought, well, why not? Yeah, okay, let's, let's not make it just what I need. Let's make it better than that. And, and it came true. And that was quite a, a wake-up call for me because I thought I, re I didn't think that I could do that, but I was bold. I put that number on the board. I had it in my bathroom so people that came to my house could see it. Um, they knew the things that I wanted. They were coming up with ideas to help me. And 
I just really felt for myself that this really works. And of course, I'd worked incredibly hard doing lots of networking and um, you know, trying to get the sort of clients that um, I needed. And so I kept doing them and it sort of you know, kept working better and better. And then I became the world's first neuroscientist in residence at a five-star hotel in London. And it got a lot of press. And I was contacted by my publisher and I met up with them and they said, you know, we've got, we've had really good books on, you know, one on exercise, one on diet, one on mindfulness, one on sleep. But we think that you as a neuroscientist could write one book that brings all of those things together. And I just said, I could do that, but I'd love to write a book about vision boards and visualization and the laws of attraction. And it just went from there. But even me saying that was because I built up my confidence. I, you know, I, I was felt bold enough to say it. I, I knew that there, it, there was a risk to doing it, but I just felt very strongly that that was aligned for me. That was the book that I wanted to write. And so, in writing it, obviously, I did the research to see if the cognitive sciences could back up the laws of attraction. And I was very pleasantly surprised to see how aligned those were. So then, my belief in merging science and spirituality became stronger. But it was really the reaction to the book after it came out that just, you know, had such a positive effect on me. Um, yeah, so I think, you know, it's, it's kind of a life's journey of having kept these elements of my life separate and then really understanding and believing that they could actually be together and work together. And that made sense um, and had a positive impact on other people. So it was just a very good circle of abundance. That's incredible. And it definitely is, is super inspiring to, to hear that you were able to like blend these two things together, blend together spirituality, manifestation, law of attraction, abundance with like the science and your, and your neuroscience background. I'm curious. Um, there's a lot of talk right now on, um, uh, when it comes to manifestation and the law of attraction I'm, is, there's a lot of talk out there when it comes to the law of attraction and when it comes to manifestation about just putting it out into the universe and just seeing like what happens. Um, in your um, understanding, based on your research, what is the universe and what isn't the universe? Yeah, oh, wow. I'm not sure if I can answer that. But I think when people say put it out into the universe, what they're really saying is identify what it is that you want. and acknowledge that maybe tell people but at least you know kind of make it clear that that's what you want and then I think there are words like source or god or the universe um, that are related to a belief in a higher power that can also help that's bigger than you that that can help you um obviously that is some people's belief, but we don't have proof of that. So although it's okay to put things into the universe, I believe that by doing that, we're essentially saying I'm sitting in the passenger seat of the car and I don't know where the car's going and I can't control its speed or its direction. Whereas if you say, I have a brain with the ability to do certain things, and I'm going to identify what I want, and I'm going to do everything I can to make those things happen, then it feels more like you're in the driver's seat of the car. So I think you can do both. Um, I'm not against putting things into the universe, but I am against not taking any responsibility or agency for yourself to facilitate that process.